from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. This is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Hey everyone, we are getting to the bottom of our question queue, so if you've been thinking about writing in, now is a great time. If we run out of questions, we will fill the empty time by trying to be funny, and no one wants that. And karaoke! And karaoke. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, right there. <laughs> and now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. Yeah, when we run out of questions, I think we have to go full ICS. That's that's our only fallback, is we just try really hard to do what they do. And we none of the training. Uh, and, we've shown, and we've shown that we can't do that. I think very you know, let's clearly. Let's just give it hell. Let's just give it hell. Jacob can carry. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just going to sit back on that one. I think Jacob just throws us on his back, gonna, and we just plow I'm 45 watch minutes. That one <laughs> silently he contributes nothing. We keep trying to set him up. He's just not going to do it. No. Yeah, and then what happens is it turns into us crying and rocking back and forth, and like Jacob, say something. Please get us out of this. <laughs> There's nothing left. <laughs> so, yeah, if you don't want to hear that, actually, people probably like do want to hear that. <laughs> like, that sounds like a great idea. Let's just listen to the tears. Yeah, no. But the queue is empty, guys. And so uh, that's awesome, though. I'm glad that we, you know, have cleaned out our queue. We've been answering questions uh, faithfully. And so if you have been in the background and thinking, oh, man, you know, I've, I've got some thoughts or I've, I've had a question about a, a previous episode or I've had something going on in my life or in a friend's life or in a family member's life. And uh, why not? Why not have a couple of therapists kick it around and see if they can give you some feedback? Uh, send it in. Come down to uh, our, our website, podtherapy.net, and there is a, a box where you can submit things uh, completely anonymously if you want. Um, and that one has kind of a limited uh, word count, but you can still submit anonymously on there. Or if you want to send us something in full, you can send it to podtherapyguys at gmail.com. And you can just put in there, hey, don't, don't read my name. And we won't. You know, that's fine. We, we're really good about not breaking rules when it comes to that. Or you can even just tweet to us. Or even on Facebook, you can send us a Facebook message. We generally check those message boxes uh, or on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people have done it all those different ways. And so that's always great. Or if you're going to be in town, if you're coming to Las Vegas uh, for the summertime and you're a listener and supporter of the show, let us know. You know, we've historically, if people are interested, we've pulled them onto the show before and uh, done a little deep dive with them. So yeah. always happy to get to meet people in person if you're in town, too. So. Definitely. It's time. Send it in, guys. Otherwise, it's going to go full ICS. But uh, we we definitely do have actual questions for this show, thank God. Yes. So we will survive. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be okay. Did you ever see that, uh, that SNL when the, uh, the, the morning show, the morning talk show, when the teleprompter stopped working? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was, Will Farrell was in it. He was okay. He was one of the guys, and then uh, and like it, it, the teleprompter stopped, so they they froze. They didn't know what to they do. don't know what to do, and so they're just like uh, they try to wing it for a little bit, <laughs> and they go to commercial break. And every time they come back from commercial break, things are more out of control. Oh, and at wow. one point, like the the uh, Will Farrell, his character killed the weatherman, <laughs> and was like eating him. <laughs> <laughs> like they they resorted to cannibalism. It just got really crazy. Yeah, that's that's definitely us without good questions. So exactly, or we just deep dive into knowledge stuff, and uh, yeah. that'll happen too. So. Which we're gonna do today. Yeah. So, uh, I wanted to kind of talk about uh, burnout. Yes, because I was sitting here thinking, like, what is, what is a good topic? Something that we can talk about for. Uh, you know, summertime. Yeah. So we're coming up on the summertime. Uh, we've got vacations planned. I know yes. you're going a couple places. Yeah, I'm going to La Jolla. And uh, during the Patreon part, we talked about a, a staycation I did at Lake Las Vegas, which, uh, you know, Jacob and I respectfully disagree on, <laughs> on the value of Lake Las Vegas. And he said some very unkind, defamatory <laughs> things, which I may or may not be forwarding to the Western Hotel. Um, but yeah. So we can tag them in this. We'll tag them. Yeah. I'm going to New Orleans. New Orleans. Oh, wait, that's right. Jacob already uh, chasing yep. me about no, this. No, no, no. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how Jacob has had such an impact on my behaviors, like because he makes fun of me. So like there's a lot of things that I just don't do anymore because I've like stepped on the Jacob. Finally. Rate. Yeah. Yeah. Just get punched right in the what nose. What does he do to get through to you that I, I haven't he been mocks, doing? He mocks. And then and he, I haven't been doing that. Like I can't say New Orleans because then I just hear Jacob's voice in my head immediately going, no. All. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's right. That's not what they say. <laughs> Jim responds right. to a specific kind of box. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Jim has a very specific learning feedback. 
<laughs> Jacob found it. <laughs> I I may understand the human condition the best out of I think you got room. it. I think you got it. <laughs> that's he's the, he's the real so. behavior changer in the room, that's not me. Probably t- uh, as evidenced by this. As is evidence. Yeah, he's got it. <laughs> now, so uh, one of the things we talk about is burnout. Yes, with jobs. So I actually happened to come across a uh, a YouTube video. Oh, cool! By uh, Dr. Tracy Marks, M A R K S. Okay, and it's really interesting. She talks about burnout, but also she kind of talks about the difference between burnout and depression. Oh, wow! Because sometimes there's she's a a, a psychiatrist. Okay. So sometimes people mistake the two. I do. Or, yeah, yeah they I think know. I always confuse them. Yeah, feeling like they're they're suffering from depression when really it's burnout and, yeah. and vice versa. So I really encourage you to take a good look at uh, Yeah, we'll put it in the episode that, description. Yeah, find yeah. that video. Click it's the episode really description good. of this episode and you can see the link. Yeah, and she kind of talks about the three components of burnout. So she identifies it as exhaustion, uh, mostly like emotional exhaustion, hmm. cynicism, and in a in efficacy in efficacy okay (laughs) so with uh like the cynicism she kind of talks about depersonalization and that's like one of the biggest things that kind of separates it separates it from uh depression essentially so personalization yeah so feeling detached from yourself feeling like you're just kind of going through the motions Motions. okay like that so that is a component with depression but it's not the primary component so of she's depression. saying while that's similar to depression when she talks about burnout she's talking about professional or right. life burnout because you could get burned out at home even if you're a stay-at-home she's specifically parent. talking about work okay so she's saying right. when you're you're going through the routines it's become monotonous she says you actually depersonalize right which feels like you your humanity is no longer engaged in this project you're a machine Right. Oh, wow. And that kind of feeds into that component of cynicism. Cynicism. Jaded. Right. Just, I don't care anymore. What's the right. point? I no longer believe in the mission. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's really kind of interesting. So it kind of made me start thinking about some of the symptoms that I identify when I start feeling burnt out. Hmm. Which for me, um, my current job. Hey, wait, can I guess them? I think I know your symptoms. Okay, yes. Of burnout. Okay, go ahead. Actually, I think I know because we've now worked at three different jobs together. Right. And I think I know exactly what happens to you whenever See, you get stressed. If, if I can remember them, because in my current job, I have got the best job ever. Yeah. I love my job. Yeah. It's I been never want to leave it. Yeah. That's so funny. That's how I feel about private practice too. Is, is now it's like I just I love the people I get to work with. So yeah. like I don't have colleagues anymore or like anybody that can make me mad. Um, okay, so having worked at three different jobs, at least with you. When I've seen you get really stressed and overwhelmed, uh, you eat. You, oh, yeah. You eat. <laughs> yeah, like, I have I seen you do that. <laughs> like one day I'll see you come in and you'll have like a rice cake that you are like sprinkling a touch of salt on and then eating with some water. And then after a bad day, I'll be like, Jim, let's go to Sonic. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. are you okay? You're like, yeah, it's fine. Just get in the car. <laughs> yeah. When like, I walk right. in in the morning with a box of Dunkin' Donuts. Yes. Yeah. And like a mocha frappuccino. And I'm yeah. like, dude, are you okay? And you're like, I don't want to talk. <laughs> like you just go in and like the door closes behind you. <laughs> like I know. Just, okay, give him like the morning to like sort himself out. <laughs> When I'm yelling down the hallway, I need a bag of marshmallows, stat. Get me marshmallows. Put them in my mouth and rub my throat. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so that's, that's one. one of your burnout coping mechanisms, I would say. I think that's one. I, I don't know. Like other ones I've seen you do, definitely the uh, you, you will take in a lot of calories. That's obviously there. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have a lot of other obvious warning flags that you're burned out. That's one. I've, I've definitely seen I think the other thing t- to me, too, is you can tell just by looking at my desk. Oh, oh yeah, you've brought this up before. Yeah. <clears throat> my desk is a physical representation of my mind <laughs> and my emotional state. So if my desk is messy and there's just stuff all over the place, right. that's a bad sign. That's bad. Yeah, yeah things if you're are getting out of control. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. That's funny. Yeah. That is true. Yeah, yeah, you walk into your office and like if everything's all over the place, it's just like step back quietly and just come back when he's ready. So I'm trying to think of things that I've noticed in you, and I honestly, I don't. I'm unshack. I'm, I'm flackable. Like I, I don't, I don't ever have. I was going to go the out. other way and yeah. say you're never not burnt out. Yeah, just the, it's like the Hulk. This it's is like, <laughs> he's just always that way. <laughs> What's the trick? I'm just always burnt out. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, just unshakable, Nick. I'm just so always uh, cool as a cucumber. Uh, there are some tips I came across these uh, these tips from MindTools.com. Okay, and this isn't really a a, a complete. Uh, 
complete list, in sure. my opinion. I think these are some good things. But I've, had, launches. I've actually got some other ideas that I want to add to this list. But some okay. of the things that they have on here, they have, number one, working with a purpose, which okay. I think is important. So, yeah. you know, having some kind of uh, – drive something that you know you have to understand why you're doing what you're doing and that, that and the work that you're doing is paying off right and sometimes that has to do with cognitive reframing right yes. you kind of have to reframe what you do and you have to look at the bigger picture of things mm-hmm. so like if i'm just if i'm in a, in a cubicle and i'm just punching numbers into a computer sometimes it's hard to find the purpose so maybe having some way of reminding yourself like i'm part of I'm one right. piece of a larger picture. By yeah. me doing this, it affects – I support the entire agency and, right. and what we're trying to do. Locate yourself in right. a larger story. Gosh, that's a really good point. Because yeah. sometimes like you get – like your world shrinks down to your personal tasks and they do become monotonous. And you're yeah. like, what is this? And like failing to see that you're part of this bigger story, this bigger project, which has its own mission – that I could see being coming like mm-hmm. huge for burnout. Number two, uh, perform a job analysis. Okay. So they have a tool on their website. And the website, again, is uh, MindTools. MindTools.com. So if you perform a job analysis, it's basically this way of kind of assessing your work and okay. your job and finding ways of uh, uh, making adjustments to make it more efficient. Oh, okay. Uh, um, number three, giving to others. Huh. So – Bringing that into your workplace, doing something that you can do to help other people. And we've actually talked about this as a way to kind of help dealing with uh, depressed emotions and stuff like that. Finding some way of helping somebody else can help you. That's actually true. And I know that in in our world, I mean, when we've partnered together and worked on different projects – that was always something I think that would be nice is like one of us would walk into the other guy's office and just be like – you know, hey, what are you up to? Uh, what can I grab a piece of or whatever? Mm-hmm. And, like, even if you're burned out, because it's nice to get out of your own job every once in a while and, mm-hmm. like, jump into somebody else's sandbox, even if you still have a full sandbox, it's I think it's refreshing because it's right. like, okay, let me help my colleague. That's still technically within my scope. It's, like, technically something my bosses would want me to do and is good for the organization, but it's refreshing because at least I'm out of my own thing and I'm, I'm creating something of favoritism in this other person. Like, they're grateful I was there. Right. And you can even do things not work-related, like bringing in a snack tray or something, setting in the break room, you know, doing something like that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, Number four, this one I really like, take control. Hmm. So one of the biggest issues that people have with uh, burnout is uh, a lack of autonomy. Okay. Just feeling like you don't have control over your work. You don't have control over what's happening. Like you're right. feeling controlled by other people. You're just kind of a, a yes, worker bee. Yes, life is right? happening to you. You're yeah. not self-directed. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that you can do with this, if there's a project that you're working on, uh, volunteer to take control of that project. Hmm. Or ask your boss, you know, right. what are some ways that I can become more autonomous in my work? What are some things that I can be responsible for? Right. Now, let me ask you this, though. Whenever we think about autonomy and we think about, like, taking control and and some of what we're describing is, like, things you can do at the job, which I think is an interesting point that you're making, right? Because I think if we talked about burnout, a lot of people would expect us to say, oh, uh, the the solution to burnout, the solution to feeling like you're ground up by this this job is to evacuate, right? Like, to get out of the job or, like, to leave and go do these other things. And that that might be part of the recipe. But so far, it's, it's, I think, interesting anyway and noteworthy. That so far the tips we're hearing have to do with what you can do in your ecosystem to, Mm -hmm. like, change the experience of work because work is sort of inevitable. Like, we're not going to, like, relieve the symptoms by taking that away. We're going to create space where you can do this a little differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting when you talk about control. You didn't – I think when I get on LinkedIn, sometimes I I get – like, there's so much toxic stuff on LinkedIn. And everybody's like, people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. And, like, it's just a place where people mostly just passive-aggressively rant. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, I see a lot of that. And I'm just Why thinking, is like, it that every social site turns into that? Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. Even it says LinkedIn. something about society, I think. But LinkedIn is like that. Jim just does racist rants on all of That's them. all right. I do. Yeah, all, all the social media platforms <laughs> I do, including LinkedIn, is this, are just places is this why, for me to passively is... throw out racism. This is why Jake Wiskirchen from The Last Show is no longer on Twitter, isn't it? Yeah, it's what it is. Yeah, he I just, just I would just say that. a lot of, like, white slurs at him, <laughs> and he just got sick of it, you know? I just oh, I'm, I have, I've gotten so good at curating my social media. <laughs> have you? How <laughs> do you do my, that? My, my personal social media, not, like, ICS stuff. But, okay. But my personal stuff, 
if if you post something that uh, that I don't like, and, th- and this is absolutely forming a bubble. Okay, <laughs> okay. and I am a, and I'm I've fully aware this. of that. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, uh, I I but like you post uh, something political. Yeah, or something that is upsetting uh, in like. In a severe way. So, like, like people will post, uh, usually with good intentions, they'll post you know, pictures of, like, maimed animals or something yeah. and, you know, to, to right. prevent animal right. cruelty. I don't give a shit what you're what, – I don't, I'm not I don't care that. why you're doing it. I don't want to be scrolling down my Facebook and feed that. and see a dog that's been, like, boiled or something. Right. You know, like, yeah. yeah. That's that's horrible and upsetting. Yeah. And Somebody it, did that the other day with, you like, do an that abortion twice. thing. You do any of that – You're I, gone. I see, so you do any of that twice, you're out. You're out. You know, and, and just pull you from the herd. Okay, you brought up a good and point. And I have no. And, and people are like, "Oh, well, you, you, you have to, you have to kind of keep people around and give, give them." The, no, you don't. Yeah, you don't. You well, don't and you have said, to. you said. Now I realize I'm kind of forming a bubble here, but yeah, not kind of. I brought, like, I'm <laughs> you are. Yeah, <laughs> it's done. But but my point though is that you, the bubble exists anyway, right? Right. Even whether or not you create it or not, I am curating the bubble exactly. So you're just taking control of a bubble that already exists, right? That's, That's true. You know, it's interesting because when we think about burnout, we're thinking about work burnout. But like what Jacob's talking about is burnout on your social media or burnout right. of anybody where it does become monotonous. You do become cynical. You don't enjoy it anymore. And it's just provocative. And it's like, okay, no, you cultivate it, which goes back to your point, take control. And right. so essentially that's what Jacob's talking about is he took control of that area of life, which is interesting because a lot of people – like I know Matt on ICS has talked about this before – um, how part of his career, part of his jobs in life is to calm the internet, right? And to go right. through, you know, different things that are happening in, in pop culture and to, you know, utilize that content to, you know, forward the goals of whatever he's working toward. And like, God, that would be, oh, <laughs> that that sounds painful, man. At some point, that's hard, right? Because how do you cultivate that? How do you bubbleize that? You can't. He You're has a good rule, it. though. We've talked about it on, on Ice Cream Social a few times, okay. which is uh, don't say something on someone else's social media that you wouldn't say while you're standing in that person's living room. Wow. Wow. It's a good that is rule. A good That's rule. Good. That is a really good rule because it goes back to your thing, like the boiling dogs thing. You wouldn't just say, hey, bro, check this out. Right. And like shove that in I brought you a face. Polaroid of a, boiled, of a boiled dog. <laughs> yeah. So the other day on my feed, I saw something about abortion and like, that's fine. Like, okay, articles about abortion. A uh, huge image of um, like late, late term abortion just right there on the Facebook feed. Like my kid is sitting right next to me and I'm like, right. dude, what the hell? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. And it's I'm real good. Uh, see? See, this is where I, I, I poorly cultivate my stuff because uh, through the journey of my nope, life, blocked. I have a lot of mm-hmm. I have a lot of religious people on my feeds, and so like I Block. get a lot of that kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> right away. Lock, lock, <laughs> You gotta go. You gotta go. No, you put, I mean, you could put something religious, and and you know, and right. I can I can see a religious thing on my feed, and that's fine. All right. If but you're being an asshole, like, yeah, right. Yeah, you're taking it really I don't care far. what the topic is. If you're being an asshole about it, you're God. probably you're probably not going to be on my personal feed anymore. But who right. is going through their Facebook seeing something like that and going, you know what, I'm going to write my governor? Like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, you're just horrified. Like, nobody's opinion gets changed because of right. this junk. Right, right. It's gross. Number five. <laughs> Back to burnout at job. Blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Number five is something that I've done. It has helped amazingly well, and it's something I have been – on you about doing for oh, the longest time. Wow, shaving my beard? No. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm really glad that B word was beard. <laughs> Exercising regularly. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> my wife called me out on this the other day, too. Tons of research supporting uh, that. Yeah, that's great. I've said all I need to say on that one. Yes, you Number have. six, learn to manage stress, which... That's number six on their list. I think that's uh, – you could probably go into a lot more detail. That's pretty uh, pretty broad. Right. Now, there are some things that I thought would be really important to put on this list that weren't. Number one, I think delegating and building a team. Yeah. So understanding what things you can pass on to other people. And I always thought that this was a, a problem because that, that was always my biggest thing is I never wanted to delegate because I saw it as my role, yes, my job. Weakness. This yeah. is what I need to do, yeah, right? Yeah, true. But I went to a training and somebody had brought out this point to me and said, no, it's not about you. It's about training them to step up and do a better job. You right. have to give people the opportunity to You're grow. You're kind of empowering right? them. Another really important thing, scheduling your free time. 
We always talk about scheduling things that are important, like jobs and all this stuff that we have to do. Right. Schedule you, your free time. You really? have to be able to write that in. I feel like, oh, oh, okay, got it. Give g- Create vacancies. Yes. But not necessarily have have... like, because I get in a big debate with my wife about this. When we go on vacation, she's like, okay, at 1 p.m. on Saturday, we're going to go down to the tour. And then at <laughs> 2 p.m., we're going to be at the aquarium. Here's your vacation itinerary. Yeah, here's your vacation itinerary. <laughs> and I'm like, F this. <laughs> like, I don't want any of this. Like, I want to just go and sit on the beach and do nothing. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, okay. So that's not what you're saying. You're no, saying I'm talking like create space I, from seven to nine tonight. That is my time. And right. that's going to be my free time. I'll my do with it what time. I want, Blank. but yep. I'm not necessarily. Okay. Absolutely. Got it. Got it. Another really cool thing that I've learned about too, detailing your out of the office automatic email response. Okay. So everybody has these auto office responses. When you're out of the office, you have this blank thing says I'm out of the office until blank to blank. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Right. But by adding a little bit of detail in there for some of the emails that you're most likely to get. Oh, if you're asking about this. Exactly. Yes. Or forward this to Nick or whatever. Yes. And it's going to cut down a lot on the work that you have to do when you come back. Oh, because you're basically picked it up. Yes. You're giving them direction on how to handle things. I like automation. I'm always about working smarter. Yep. Or not at all. And another one, too, that I thought about was changing your environment. Like when you go on vacation to actually go someplace different. Yeah. Instead of taking your vacation time to sit at home. Okay. And not do anything. So to just have free time. Okay. To actually get out, change your environment, experience absorb- something new. I I think that that's a good Nick Tangeman piece of advice. I think yeah, that, that one doesn't apply to everybody. Yeah, because I, I think it depends on how you recharge, right? Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that they recharge by going home and reading a book, right? Or like turning off all the lights and just watching Netflix or whatever. You know, I think right. that everybody has different things. But for some people, getting out and shaking it up, traveling, that's a recharge. One more too. I just remembered improving mindfulness. Ah. So doing some kind of mindfulness exercise, whether it be meditation or something like that, okay. something that you can do that you can break away from your office for five to 10 minutes and do that could help you kind of bridge those gaps between vacation times and weekends and all that. Yeah, no, I like it. And so like summertime is a good time to talk about burnout. I think because a, a lot of us, this is when we're going to use some vacation time or we're going to get out of the office for a little while. And I think that, you know, what you're talking about with those tips is how do we make that more than an accidental recharge? How do we do it with intention? How do we try to come back fresh minded? And a lot of times the worst feeling ever is when you're done with a vacation and you have to start work the next day. And then you feel like you need a vacation from your vacation. Like you ever had that feeling where it's like that hangover effect. You're just like, I'm not ready for this. I know you got a vacation. You got to plan a a day or two buffer. The the laundry day. Yeah. The get home. Got to just have quiet time. You got to plan the chill day. The chill day. That's whenever you regroup and get your brain back up to speed. I never do that. No, you just no, come right that, back. That is my biggest weakness. Oh, I idea. need to do that. Can't do that. But I've done that before, like like flying back from Paris or oh, something. And start and the like, next day. Yeah, I'm right oh. the next day. Oh, I, it's I know, miserable. I know a ton of people who, because I mean, I, I do show business, and so we work at night. Oh right. I know a ton of people who fly back that afternoon and then go and have into a night show, show at night. Oh, oh. Yeah, that'd be terrible. And I'm like, you you people are crazy. <laughs> I mean, if it's like, unavoidable, you, know, you come back. If yeah. you're coming back on a Saturday, you get back on Saturday. You take Sunday off and you start back you on Monday. You got to regroup. Right. Jacob, what will you do to regroup? What's a down day look like in your world? I thought I'd watch a movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just like feet up on the couch, watch a movie. Yeah. Nothing going on. Yeah, yeah. Just I, veg. If I'm if I'm gonna have a if I'm gonna have a down day, then I'm then I might do something like that. I might do like a small project. Okay. Like a house. Yeah, like a house a house but project. For but I'm you, probably gonna be around the house. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll putz around, turn a screw. Exactly. Yeah. Not much. But yeah. Not like take on a huge task and that you feel like your day was wasted. Right. Okay. That's yeah. a, that's a good. And idea. there's gonna be whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I, so I what, so that. really no different than any other day? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> he's saying off days. Uh, there will be, there will be maybe a, a little more whiskey than another day, but not, not much. <laughs> <laughs> there will be whiskey, as there is, you know, at ICS. Other or, days. Uh, so. Underneath the desk, anywhere I Every go. Every other day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll have my flask. <laughs> What's your down day look like, Nick, whenever you do a, a, an intentional unplug? Um, sometimes it'll be just playing guitar. If I'm around the house, but I have to get out of the house. Yeah, otherwise you yeah, you work I at home. Work from home, right? So I have to get out. I I want to go places. I want to go do something. Yeah, I have to be active. It's funny. I'm a lot like Jacob, where I am never home. Like I work about twelve yeah. hours a day, and so like whenever I get home, my wife like on a weekend will be like, "Hey, you know, now that you're here, like I think I'm gonna like go shopping all day," and I'm like, "Go." 
Just don't make me go. Like, right. as long as I can sit here. I don't mind the kids being here. Like, as long as I can sit here and I don't have to leave this house, I'm great. Like, I do not need anything. So, yeah. that's mine, too. Except, minus the, the house chores thing. I can't build things. So, I'm actually forbidden out from trying to turn a... Yeah, yeah. So, I usually purchase my objects on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, present them as if I created them. <laughs> and then win races, Nick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I love seeing you try. I love yeah. seeing you try to work on stuff. You go over there and it's like, why is there blood on everything? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, you know, it is a sex dungeon, so right. it's going to be what it is. <laughs> No pain, right. no promise. So that's our A block on burnout. Hopefully you got something useful out of that. I did. But we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will discuss female low libido. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's their producer sponsor is Robert Browning Jr. Mint. Robert was a German composer, pianist, organist, and conductor of the early Romantic period. Junior Mint's compositions include symphonies, concertos, piano music, and chamber music. His best-known works include the overture and incidental music for A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Italian Symphony, the Scottish Symphony, the Horatio Elijah, the overture, the Herbridays, his mature violin concerto, and his string octet, the melody for the Christmas carol, Hark! The Herald Angels Sing is also his. Junior Mint's Songs Without Words are his famous solo piano compositions. Oh, that was filled with a lot of hard words. That's if why you, I picked it. That was a good one. If you'd like to make the show possible and join uh, great composer Robert Browning Jr. Mint, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is about female low libido. Hi, I was sort of wondering what your stances were on asexuality. I personally have never felt sexual attraction before, but I also have a history of depression for most of my life. I've heard people say that low sex drive is usually due to depression, but I've also heard people say it's normal for women not to feel a sex drive and that they usually just go along with things for the sake of their partners. Do you think this is something to get help for? Is it normal? Or just some sort of orientation to the subject? Thank you, Zoe. Okay. Great question. That is a good question. Yeah, I don't think I we've like had that one yet. No, no, that's that's really neat. I, I like the difference of that. So, um, well, yeah. I, the, the very first thing that that she's asking, do you think I uh, do you think this is something that somebody should get help for? And I guess I would say, well, is it causing problems? Number one, that's usually our biggest right? standard. Yeah, right. I mean, is are you fine with that? Is that is that just kind of your lifestyle, and that's just how you feel? And if it's not causing you any problems, then yeah, probably not. I, th- I think you're probably okay. But on the other hand, if it is causing you problems, if you feel like uh, it's causing stress in relationships, or um, that there, you know, something about it is is affecting you, then yeah, then maybe that's when you would need to have a conversation with somebody. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, anytime we're talking about sexuality, uh, whether that's um, what we might call hypo sexuality, right? So low mm-hmm. sex drive or hyper sexuality, a higher sex drive. Um, to us, it's about figuring out whether this is going to cause you problems. And that's usually going to be a question of your relationship mm-hmm. and whether or not you're sexually compatible, which if you remember from like, uh, I don't even know how many episodes ago, how many weeks ago it was, but I, I got on a soapbox about this at one point. It was answering a question about relationships and was trying to say, Hey guys, something that doesn't get talked about enough, which absolutely needs to be talked about is sexual compatibility. Because it, to the writer, Zoe, if you are what we might call asexual, which we should define for the, the listeners in a second, you need to have a really transparent conversation with anybody who might want to be you know, your love interest in life because it's important to present to them, this is something that I kind of know about myself. If you do, I mean, I, honestly, I hear kind of some honest questioning even in that of like, you know, is this something that's true for me and what does that mean? I think that that's fair. Okay. But yeah, so I mean, asexuality. Let's let's unpack that a little bit. Well, the dictionary defines it as a quality or characteristic of having no sexual feelings or desires, or the quality of reproducing without the fusion of. No, that's that's, that's a different. That's, one. A that's a biological. One. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, just basically no having no sexual feelings or desires. Now, I guess what, there's a, there, then there's a difference between asexuality and uh, just having a low libido, right? Because, right. I mean, having no sexual feelings or desires, that's the absence of, whereas a low libido maybe just is, is at a very low level. It's still there. You still have those desires. You still have those feelings. But it's 
problematic in that sense. Yeah, but I mean, let's take on that other question, though, Nick, because there is this this deeper question, which and again, this is one of those moments that you, you know, usually famously talk about how we as two uh, heterosexual white males in the studio are the least qualified to take on the question. But the writer is talking about, hey, um, overall. Do we notice a difference in uh, sexuality and sexual desire among women? Because the, the author volunteers this and says, hey, I, am, I, I know how the internet works. I know how stereotypes work. And I have bumped into this stereotype that is women have a lower sex drive. Um, is that something that we could speak to and say that we've seen? Or is this completely you know, out of left field, not true at all, never seen this before in my life? So in the DSM-5, um, they have an entire section which has to do with sexual dysfunctions, right? And so a lot of people don't know that. They think that, you know, whenever you're having any kind of sexual issue, um, that you need to probably go to a urologist um, or, you know, your gynecologist, that it, it's entirely a hardware issue. But that's not true. A lot of sexual issues are actually classified in the DSM, and they are software issues. They are things that have to do with your mental programming. Um, so again, I'm going to highly, I'm going to rate this episode explicit already because I talked about sex dungeons. Um, but delayed ejaculation <laughs> is, is one of the issues that's in the DSM-5. Erectile disorder is in the DSM-5. Um, female orgasmic disorder. A lot of people don't know that that's actually in here, which is that inability to actually have an orgasm. Um, and so that's important to note too. And then female sexual interest and arousal disorder. So to the writer, that was the one I wanted to hunt down. Sorry for the delay. But um, there's also pain disorder in here, uh, like pelvic pain that doesn't have to do with any kind of like good experience, like something that tells us, oh, this thing's broken. It's, it's psychosomatic. Um, male hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So that's low libido in males. And then premature ejaculations in here. I'm just giving them all away because I want to make sure people know that these are in the DSM-5. Right. But then I want to circle back to uh, female hypoactive arousal disorder. I think that's what it was called. And I want to kind of just share for the listener kind of what these criteria are that we're talking about with that. So there's a male one and then there's a female one. And even as I present this to you, I think the listener will understand why this is debatable, like why this is something that there was a big debate in our profession about. So it is a... Uh, 302.72, female sexual interest or arousal disorder. So here are the criteria according to the DSM-5. Uh, first, lack of significantly reduced sexual interest or arousal as manifested by at least three of the following. Absent or reduced interest in sex. Absent or reduced sexual erotic thoughts or fantasies. No reduced initiation of sexual activity, typically unreceptive to partner's advances. Absent or reduced sexual excitement or pleasure during sexual activity. Absent or reduced sexual interest or arousal in response to any internal or external sexual stimuli. Absent or reduced genital or non-genital sensations during sexual activity. And then it just kind of unpacks that a little bit deeper as far as like the sexual dysfunction is not better explained by a substance or anything like that. Right. So what's interesting about this is when this was being debated during the construction of the DSM-5, there was a big debate about that because they were saying, hey, careful, you're about to pathologize right. not having sexual interest. You're going to call that a disorder. Right. And that's going to mess up a lot of relationships because they're going to come out and say, hey, there's something wrong with you. You right. have a disorder, as mentioned in the DSM-5. Which has been an ongoing issue with every revision of the DSM. Right. right? I mean, going all the way back to homosexuality at one point yes. was listed as a disorder. I want to say it was in there as early as the DSM-3. Yeah. yeah. And then DSM-4, they got rid of it. Right. And recently, the World Health Organization also started to take on some of the stuff and got rid of trans as, as a disorder. But to the writer's question, the reason I wanted to unpack that like officially with the real like written word of the DSM is because the writer's question is asking us, is this a problem? Like, is asexuality a valid lifestyle thing? Is this just who I am? Or do I have a problem? Or is this a symptom of depression? So candid answer to Zoe. Is it a symptom of depression? Yes, could be. it can be a corollary with depression. I would doubt that in your case, because you're talking about lifelong depression and lifelong low sexual arousal. When both of have coexisted for that long, I don't usually tie them together. I usually start to conclude this might just be how you're wired. You just might have low libido. And you have depression, which, by the way, we want you to treat. But like low libido is just like a real thing. Right. That's not I've, I've never been on board with calling that a disorder. Um, I've just never felt that that's very fair, especially when we're talking about something that's been in existence for a long, long time, right? Like if you 
usually have a sexual baseline of a 7 out of 10. And over the last six months, you've noticed that you're at a 3 out of 10. And it's causing despair in your relationships and a clinically significant amount of distress. Then I'd be comfortable having a conversation with that person, not about them without them, in which they tell me this and I might feel comfortable identifying that this is female arousal disorder, right? right. But in Zoe's case, I don't know that I feel comfortable going to that direction. Um, but I do feel comfortable with the concept of asexuality, which to me is a statement of your truth. Like if you are bisexual, that is a statement of your sexual orientation. If you are hypersexual, I, I see that as a statement of your sexual orientation. Um, if you are pansexual, I see that as a statement of your sexual orientation. Asexual to me, and what I've seen it used in, in context, and I think that Dr. Steelman talks about this on the episode in May that we had her on, asexuality is an absence of sexual orientation. It is just non-participant. It is just, I don't have much drive in any direction toward any being. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that's ent entirely valid. There's nothing wrong with you. I don't want to say that that's caused by depression. I don't want to say that that's a female characteristic because I don't know that it is. I think that is your personal characteristic and there's absolutely nothing wrong about that. But self-awareness is the key. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I ultimately, I think it just kind of boils down to, I mean, each individual has to determine for themselves whether or not it's a problem. Right. Right. I mean, is it causing clinically significant amount of distress? Yeah. If so, um, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that it's highly unlikely or it's not, I don't want to say highly unlikely. It's unlikely that it may be related to the depression. Um, uh, but how would it, let's, let's just say hypothetically for her, Zoe, let's say, yes, it's a problem. It's causing me issues in my relationships. I feel like I can't sustain a relationship. What should I do? Is it something that you can treat? Is it something that you can go in and work with a therapist on? It is a very tricky tightrope to walk, right? Because I want to honor the sovereignty of Zoe. And right. so if she came, if, if, let's say Zoe's, I don't think that Zoe says so in this, but let's say Zoe's heterosexual and let's say that she's married to Jack. And so Jack and Zoe come in and they're saying, hi, we've been married for three years. Our sex is very low. It's never really happening. And Zoe presents to me that she's been depressed for a, lot of, a long time and also is suspicious that maybe she's asexual. Let's say I hear the story in that context. That's a very tricky one for me, right? Because on one hand, I want to address the problem as long as Zoe sees it as a problem. Right. But if Zoe sees this as this is who I honestly with all my heart am – it becomes a problem for the relationship where Jack looks at that and says, fix her. And I look at right. that and say, I don't know that I can because they're wired this way. And this becomes a problem where now I'm calling something wrong when this might be just who you naturally are. Right. And then it becomes a deeper question of, okay, are you guys compatible now? And like it would be unfair for Zoe to say, well, you're not allowed to leave me. And we're not going to change the rules of this relationship. You're stuck with me. This is it. You signed up for A, but it turned out to be B. It's a bait and switch. It is what it is. That's not fair to Jack, right? right. And so, like, I think I would become more of a couples counselor of helping them renegotiate how Jack's needs still get to be valid and get to be met and how we don't have to necessarily make Zoe, who's a square peg, fit into a round hole. Right. I just feel like yeah. that. I, I believe in authenticity. I believe in sovereignty. Um, so to Zoe, if this is something that didn't used to be this, but now it is, that's something that shows us that it can change. If it's causing a clinically significant amount of distress, which means you're, you're having bad relationships and you wish this was different, um, then that's something you can be treated for. And, and so the way that you would look for that is I would honestly tell you to go look for a sex therapist, um, which honestly is a little bit different to find than you're going to find in the general population of therapists. Um, they might identify as a sex therapist, but generally I, I point people toward the directory on ASECT, which is A-A-S-E-C-T. And that's a great website, AASECT. It has a directory of therapists in your area. And if you can find an ASECT-approved uh, therapist, they might have a lot more advanced training when it comes to addressing things like libido and techniques that can honor your authenticity and who you actually are and also your desire to work with and change your own sexuality. Right. In a way that is healthy and honors who you really are. So it's a very tricky situation, Nick. And, you know, it was a really detailed question there. I appreciate the honesty. I think yeah. it's a really good one. I wish, you know, it's, it's not a light switch kind of problem where it's like depressed, not depressed. It's a, it's a, s a situation where we're navigating identity and yeah. desire. And that is just really intrinsic. So yeah. it's a really complicated one. Yeah. Great question, Zoe. Great. Thanks for writing in. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we discuss gin Xers and mental health. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's Therapy's sponsor is Kayla Lansbury. 
Kayla was the first lady of the United States from 1809 to 1817. She was noted for holding Washington social functions in which she invited members of both political parties, essentially spearheading the concept of bipartisan cooperation, albeit before that term was in use in the United States. I have a guess as to who she is, and I don't even okay. know the dates. Go ahead. Is, what, I know Jacob, exactly who she is. You think you know who she is? I think that she's uh, Abraham Lincoln. There's only Lincoln's. one person she can be. Is she Abraham Lincoln's wife? No. No. Who the hell is she? It's uh, FDR's wife. No. Oh, that's way too late, dude. 1809. I didn't to listen to the dates. I just listened to the. Uh, <laughs> I listened to the time period. That's Eleanor oh. Roosevelt, isn't no. it? El- no. So okay, 1809. Yes. Dude, that is early. Yes. That's got to be like Jefferson's wife. No. That's got to be. Hold on. Uh, it's before term limits. That's that's why I think that's why I thought FDR. It wife. is before term limits. Is it? Uh, oh, now we got to get this. Is it? <laughs> okay, so it's 1800s, early 1800s. The nation was founded in 76. I'll give you another hint. Okay. This was uh, there was a big war that happened. This is when the the Capitol and the White House burnt to the ground. Okay, she was responsible. She was the one that saved the portrait of George Washington. Oh my God! She went in there and she oh she this, went back into uh, the Adams. Close, you're getting closer. Yeah. Uh, oh, it Coolidge. Dude, no, it's not Coolidge. I know, I know, it's, I know this. Time. <laughs> <laughs> she was hot to trot, Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? I don't know. Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison. Madison. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so president. Who's President Madison? James. James. Madison. James Madison. Ah, so James. Okay, got it. So Kayla Lansbury is Dolly Madison. Yes. For some reason, all I can think about when I hear Dolly Madison is like uh, little cakes, <laughs> like zebra cakes. <laughs> I don't know if that's associated, but it's all I can think about right now. I always got her confused with Holly Madison. Who's Holly Madison? <laughs> She's a very different person. <laughs> Who is that? Is that a famous she was, person? Yeah, she was one of the Playboy bunnies that was, uh, she was married to, uh, uh, what's his face for a while? Mr. Have, Madison? You, you have her. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> That'll be our next one. We'll, we'll have to reserve that for Kayla next time. <laughs> and she worked with uh, Jacob the Audio Guy. Yeah. In the Peep Show, Las what? Vegas. What? Damn. That's pretty cool. So I didn't realize you'd work with, uh, you know, deceased female presidents or wives of presidents. You'll get there. If you'd like to join <laughs> no, uh, Kayla Lansbury, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, it's patreon.com slash therapy. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is about Gen Xers and mental health. Hey, guys. I'm over 40 and have recently found success with therapy and treatment of adult ADHD. You may recognize me from Twitter or the Ice Cream Social Facebook group because I just can't seem to shut up about it. I want people my age, especially guys, to know there's nothing wrong with getting help and to recognize that you may need help and not realize it. We Gen Xers were told we were lazy, apathetic, and slackers when they were growing up, and it's very hard to escape that mindset. Speaking from my own experience, my parents were hardworking people, and for them, it never crossed their minds that my poor grades and lack of motivations was anything other than laziness. In fact, even now that I'm on medication and thriving, they are still pretty skeptical. At that time, there wasn't the awareness that there is now. So hearing that I was lazy for 10 solid years, I just believed it. Even after the rise in awareness of ADD and ADHD and seeing the list of symptoms, I would say, yeah, but I'm just lazy. It took being in a relationship with a therapist and hearing stories from people my age about their experience with therapy and treatment before I would even consider the option. I joke that my dad bought a Corvette to do with his midlife crisis and i started therapy to deal with mine (laughs) i just wanted to share my thoughts on the subject and maybe you guys can expound upon them and tell me that i'm full of shit thanks just chris (laughs) well good news that's a great one man i love it you're not full of shit ah so that's the good not just full of shit (laughs) that's true i'm only hearing your opinion on this that's right yeah (laughs) i don't know if like you're into other things by the way the earth is flat (laughs) wait it's not i don't know what you're going with that (laughs) how dare you god created the earth in six thousand years and made it flat because that's the bible's flat See. All right, we'll stick around, patrons, because we're because we're going <laughs> to dig into this right after the show. Oh, did you did you see the articles about that? No, about the evangelicals uh, making fun of the flat earthers. No, no, <laughs> for oh, not no. for not understanding how, how science works. works. <laughs> 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 you fools. Oh. <laughs> just, I, I already died that that's day. That's a can of beans you don't want to open. 
That <laughs> I'm is, sure it's pretty good. Oh, We're going to have to find that. Yeah. That I just, would be fun. That makes me want to just get comfortable on the couch with like some, popcorn, some popcorn. And just, yeah, yeah. Just, just right. watch them debate that. Let's do this. Yeah. Just dive in <laughs> deep. Specifically, it was uh, Ken Ham, the guy, oh, uh, the Ark Encounter the guy in Kentucky. Of course the Earth's round. Right. That's how God created it. 50 well, years ago. We right. have this book. <laughs> the Bible says the earth's round, therefore it's round. Oh, man. So anyway, this has nothing to do with Chris. Uh, but Chris, that's awesome, man, that you you responded to what you call your midlife crisis instead of buying a Corvette. You went to therapy. And, and this is a big point, Nick. As science goes on, as healthcare goes on, uh, my wife always jokes that our kids are going to look back on things we ate and drank and did and be horrified. They're going to look at it the oh, way yeah. that I look at smoking and All be right. like, oh, my gosh, can you believe that anybody ever bought the lie that that wasn't cancerous? You know. And so as time goes on, we become more aware of things that at the time we were completely ignorant about. And that kind of sounds like that's what's happened to Chris. Yeah, and it also I think it, it says a lot to things that we attribute to personal flaws or personal right. characteristics. And I am guilty of this all the time mm. with the generational thing. Okay. Right. And you've called me out on this several times. You a baby boomer. When, uh, yeah, as, <laughs> as a baby boomer myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but like the whole, uh, uh, what's the newest gener the, the millennials. millennials. Oh, yeah, okay. You yeah. know, and, and how just the entitlement and all of this stuff. And I really get stuck in that and yeah. look at it as a personal flaw and a personal characteristic. Yeah. But then also having to look at, no, it's just, it's just different. Yeah. Like every generation does this with the generation that comes after them. Right. Right. Every generation rips on the next one because they feel like they've got it so much easier and they're just so different and they're such terrible people and the world's going to go to hell. And it never does. Overall, the world is continuing to get better yeah. by, by a lot of different statistics and stats and things that we look at, you know, by all different measures, the world is getting better. Yeah, and it, but to your point of like how we tend to judge the next generation, and that's Chris's point. Like, yeah. and this, I, I really agree with this. This is a hill I will die on, and you guys have all heard me get pissy about this. But Chris is making a good point. The entire quote, "Generation X," was to insult an entire generation of humanity, right. <laughs> and it was a, a label placed upon them by their elders for being less than. And they wanted you to get that. Like, your Generation X. There wasn't, like, they weren't doing the alphabet crap back then. It was, oh, right. baby boomers, why? They had a lot of kids. Okay, what do you call their kids? Failure. <laughs> Generation X. And it's funny, Nick, because you talk about how this is a perpetual thing. We all do this. Like, you are living in denial that you're a millennial, even though I have proven to you mathematically that you are, and that culturally you are. But that <laughs> name means so much to you and has such a bad reputation <laughs> yes. that it, like, you just vomit it up. Like, your body rejects it. What is the generation <laughs> after millennial? Because there must be one now. I, they're calling it I... Generation Z, tentatively, and okay. then they're still, like, looking for a life event that would, like, characterize them. Huh. But, like, my children children are my children are whatever comes after millennials but because like by by some of the math like i'm a millennial nick probably is yeah uh jim's very old so he's not yeah 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 <laughs> but i mean the, well, the math that the, i've heard millennial is jim's 80, just generation one just generation one and the next one <laughs> yeah. 1980 to 2000 is is a millennial or or they say sometimes right. 1985 2005 well and see yeah that's if it's 85 then i'm not if it's right. 80 then i am yeah but i think that you are you you have thick rim glasses a beard and you wear flannel sometimes i can take these off right now if you could just vape that's, right that's, now that makes the difference. That, <laughs> listen i'll do whatever i have to do but it's funny because coming See, there is there's there's like a middle ground one in there though that's the, zennials that's it yeah zennials the, that's it's the like millennials the, the that, that were born millennial in, transition that, that like didn't have uh, internet and cable and everything when they were right. born they they played in the streets and all yes. you know they came home when the street lights came on that but then they're also techno that literate group. yeah right but then they were there for the beginning Earliest adopters of, yeah yep. Now, yeah. you also have to take into effect culture and where they're raised because – Yes. So my – Iowa is like 30 my, years my, behind wherever my, where it is. So my, <laughs> my good friend Brian – Oh, I hate so agreeing with Jim. <laughs> and I'm right. No. You know I'm right. I'm, I'm not agreeing disagree with you. Hold on. Yeah. Nick's I'm not like, I was born either. in 1980 and I grew up playing hoop and a stick. I, I'm not <laughs> – look, I'm not disagreeing either. Okay, and that can a good kick my, <laughs> my point here – was that my friend Brian, who was on one of our episodes, the goal setting one? Yeah. Okay, so he grew up in Palm Springs. Yeah. And he's older than me by about I think four four or five years. Okay. Okay. And 
and we were talking and we were talking about childhood and everything and, and all these things that we remember. And he's like, wait a minute. How do you, how do you remember that? Uh-huh. Cause that was, that was, that was my era. Yeah. Why do you know about it? Yeah. And I said, because he grew up in California. I grew up in Iowa. So it took about five years to, to, to migrate yeah, radiate to the Midwest for culture to get so to the Midwest. Culturally, that's true. We're the same age. That's okay. That's an interesting point. Yes. I actually don't hate you on that. I think that you're kind of right. <laughs> the concept of cultural age versus biological age. Right. I, I, I would concede that point, but I still think you're a millennial, but <laughs> you, you said this point earlier and this is what Chris is saying. Like the entire like label of generation X was defamatory. And it was a time when people were saying everybody was in agreement, like, oh, the kids these days, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I want to read you a quote, and I want you to just hear this and think about which generation you think this is describing. Okay? <laughs> okay. This is a quote by a person who was describing the next generation that came after them, and I want you to guess which generation this is. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in places of in oh and love chatter in place of exercise and discipline. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. That could be any. Oh, this is going to be like the generation born in like between 1860 and <laughs> that 1880. Quote, yeah, these are the Puritans. That yeah. quote is from Plato. <laughs> there you go. Plato said that. Plato said that according to Socrates in the year 469 BC. There you go. <laughs> 500 years before Christ, this dude was saying the next generation's shit. <laughs> they love luxury. What with their stone tablets and their wheels? <laughs> they don't know what. It was like. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, he wasn't wrong. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The Athenians yeah. were well known for yeah. just being complete d bags. But no, it's funny, right? Because Chris's point is like in that generation, mental health was not respected. It was not talked about. Right. It was an excuse. And so your kid wasn't lazy, or your kid didn't have ADHD, or we that wasn't even a recognized right. term. And I remember growing up, even you know, being thirteen, fifteen years old, and hearing comedians like Bill Engvall. And he was like a, a country comedian in the yeah. Jeff Foxworthy kind of vein. And he was talking about how uh, somebody was asking him, oh, you know, I got attention deficit disorder. My, my teenager has attention deficit disorder. And he was like, oh, I had that once. And they were like, once? And he's like, yeah, one day my dad was talking to me and I wasn't paying attention. I had attention deficit disorder. And he smacked me in the face and got my attention back. And the whole crowd's like, ha, 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 right? Kids are dumb. <laughs> yeah. And like, obviously, as a clinician, I'm horrified because I'm like, no, no, no. There's like medicine. Like, there's kids whose entire life would have looked one way, and then because we diagnosed this and treated this and helped them, they now have access to an entire different career and an entire different future because we took it seriously and we didn't minimize them. And for Chris, that didn't happen. And that's right. frustrating, man. Which it, it, it actually kind of ties into my big pet peeve with old school. Yes. That I have, which yeah. I always hated that when people, if someone came in and they were interviewing for a job and they said, I'm as, old a, school. as a therapist, yeah, if they said oh, they were right. old school, the interview was over. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not hiring you. Because essentially, for there to be an old school, there has to be a new school. And why are you right? not in it? <laughs> yeah. There, which means we've developed new, better ways, better techniques. And to say I'm old school is saying I am rejecting new information and new technology to right. continue to live in this other way. Great. Go ahead and do that, but you're no good to me. Right. Like, you're not helping me out. I'm not going to hire you for this position. Yeah. I want people who are innovative, who are going to come up with new things. Right. And and I'm also, I, I totally know the spirit in which you're saying that, because I think you and I are also very aware that there is something called ageism, and that it goes both ways, though. And that's sure. the thing, is like, I don't want to see somebody in their 50s or 60s discriminated against. Oh, you, you mean like calling somebody know. a baby boomer when they were born in, in the 80s? Yeah, nobody's crying for your broken heart, Nick. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> I don't think you know what discrimination is. <laughs> you called me white the other day. <laughs> I'll be damned. I, I <laughs> Shut up, th- cracker. I don't think you know what that word means. <laughs> but like, Jacob, what, what, if I just, if somebody was passing you on the street and they said, dude, what, what uh, generation are you? What would you just, what's your hot take? This is what I think is true. Gen X. You feel Gen X. Yeah. Do you know what I associate Gen X with? And and I don't really I don't even really know what Gen X means. Right. You just you But that's what that, I grew up it feels right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I grew up thinking. When somebody asks me describe a Gen Xer, my answer is they listen to KISS unironically. Great. <laughs> then <laughs> I am it. definitely Gen X. <laughs> <laughs> if they listen to hard rock, like classic rock. Yes. And unironically, like they're into it and it wasn't handed to them. They're not I doing it because the of good memories. radio station in my car is currently set to a classic rock station. That's it. To me, you are a Gen Xer. That has his mind. 
<laughs> and I know that that's ridiculous because like there's got to yeah. be country people and rap people and ev- they're all Gen Xers too. But for some reason, anytime also I hear most the classic Gen rock X. people just hate Kiss. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah that's, that's what true. I was going to say. Is like classic rock and like, Kiss. Kiss. I don't know. If yeah, you're, yeah, you're not using a very good because example. of your musical taste, Nick. I would say my mind wants you to be a Gen Xer. Yeah, and I think of millennials. I think of people that like listen to. I don't know. I I, I don't even know. In sync, I guess was popular. Like that's yeah. a thing and. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Keep telling us what's popular with the kids. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you what's hot. Let me tell you what's hot right now, okay? I, I want – this is a new segment here on Pop Therapy. I'm Jim. taking over right now. This is – Jim tells us what's happened with the kids. Let me tell you what the kids are into. These AOL chats are on fire, all right? There's a lot of this uh, AOL chatting. They're calling it cybering, okay? you got to watch out for this. Something you got to watch out for with the kids. They can't send pictures. Can we please replace the the uh, the apologies section with Jim? Jim comments on what is current. Yeah. Jim, Jim knows what's cool. Let me tell you what else is cool. Here's Candy what's cigarettes. Up with the kids. Candy cigarettes are hot right now. They're everywhere. I'm not against it. I think it's fine. It's harm reduction, if anything. Playboy magazines. Got to watch out for those. <laughs> They're That's finding so them at funny. all the uh, the smoking shops and at your local uh, purveyor of magazines. Found <laughs> porn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the thing. That was back in bush, the day. Bush porn. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was the thing, man. It's amazing how... You know, That's that... porn in a bush, not porn with a bush. No, <laughs> no. Bush porn is a Las Vegas concept. Oh, where... I thought it was the Bush family. No, no. Well, that's a different the, thing. The political dynasty. That's a different thing. Oh, Babs. <laughs> no, Babs. <laughs> Babs knows. <laughs> no, it's funny. That that would actually be a good topic for the show one day. If we ever get one um, on, like... I've I've had cases where I have guys that have erectile dysfunction that are in their early 20s. Mm-hmm. And I've had to explain to them, like, this is actually a concept of that we're seeing as a result of pornography, which there's a big debate about it. Does porn cause social harm? I'm not Mm -hmm. on that team. I don't believe porn causes social harm, but I do believe that, yes, it does affect the wiring structure of the the human brain. It's a neurology question. And um, it's very interesting because there's this thing called analog pornography versus digital pornography. And there's this generational gap where in previous generations, they grew up with finding porn magazines, right? You went to your, your buddy's house, he has an older brother or an uncle, or you go into an old school barber shop and they just have it laying around. Or mm-hmm. you grew up in Las Vegas and like there was little vending machines with like the erotic dancer like magazines right. or whatever. And you just find one on your way home from school or whatever. And like that was a different kind of pornography than like this HD search what you want, find the rabbit trail, click the recommended videos down and down. Oh, and rabbit down. trail porn is good Rabbit stuff. trail is hot. <laughs> it's very hot right now. Another Another thing yeah, the kids yeah. are talking about <laughs> this is this Oregon Trail porn. It's so, really getting there. Jim so, just put his finger in the air when he said that's what the kids are talking about. This is it. <laughs> Eureka! I know about this next generation. But Plato talked a lot about this kind of porn, too. Okay. And so, you know, you just don't want to fall asleep at the wheel. So thanks, Chris. This is where your letter got us. <laughs> what was it about? <laughs> oh, ADHD. No, no, I agree with that. I agree. The point is... He was undiagnosed, and that was a bad thing for his life. And, and right. I respect that he went back as an adult, and a, adult ADHD is a real thing. And the, the, I think the last point that I want to make here, too, is that this is a really good example of how the way we talk about something affects the way people behave towards it. Yes. So yes. preventing him from actually getting help much earlier on in his life yes, because of the stigma that was associated with it. it took a long time to get to that point yeah we've talked about this same cultural point about a lot of things like suicidality people are like oh i don't want right. to like enable them and we're always like no, no no let's talk about let's change the context of the conversation not from poor me pity party crap to you sound like you need help let me point you toward helpers right and like mm-hmm. taking people seriously right where they're at giving them the benefit of the doubt and and that would have changed this dude's life. And, you know, again, Chris, we're not, you know, singing your swan song here. I mean, you're in your 40s. You're doing a great job. And the fact that you are willing to step up and get therapy, I think, is huge because there is that cultural stigma, especially for men and especially men who are older than in their 30s. A lot of men still have the remnants of that older voice inside of them that speaks from a different era that tells them, yeah, that's fine for other people, but you would never need that. Right. You know, that's fine for other people, but you're self-reliant, you're strong. Um, there's people in your life that you would want to get help, but you're not among them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for Chris to challenge that voice and say, to hell with it, let's give it a shot, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm in I'm in my midlife, I'm going to do something crazy, let's do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, good for you, man. I love it. So I think that's tremendous. Yeah. And it gave us an opportunity to discuss uh, platonic porn and 
which seems we like every every uh, I think we have plenty of chances. It seems no. like every topic we talk about ends up going there for some reason. <laughs> it just seems like that's always know, where we yeah. land. <laughs> it's pre-Socratic pornography. Maybe we need to talk to somebody. <laughs> I think we need to bring a philosophy <laughs> major right here. <laughs> Maybe we need to. Yeah. We bring another therapist on here just to work with us. All right. Thanks, Chris. Make us right. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you very much. And we want to thank our Patreons, of course, those who support us at patreon.com slash therapy. We want to thank um, the Elite Eight, our mysterious and shrouded uh, Illuminati bosses. We want to thank the Thera producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop. Thank you, Jake Schneider. Thank you, Robert Brownie Jr. Mint. Thank you, uh, Dolly Madison, <laughs> Kayla Lansbury. Thank you, David Data Scoop, Vialon, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Dr. Ben Don, and ex officio board member Ellie O'Dare. And we are recording this early, so if there are any new Therapals or Therapods, uh, thorapo- Therapods, uh, we're not announcing you because we don't know yet. Yep, because uh, we are both uh, vacating during uh, the month of June, doing a little mm-hmm. bit of R and R. So, and if you would like to hear this episode uncut and unedited, and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, including our book club, you can go to Patreon.com/therapy and sign up. And again, thank you all for supporting mental health. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Help us reach others by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided in your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, and now at patreon.com slash therapy. If you want to submit a question to the show, ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangeman. I'm Jim Jobin. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week.